Let's go. Welcome to the Trusted Leader Show. I'm your host, David Horsager. Join me as I sit down with influential leaders from around the world to discuss why leaders and organizations fail, top tactics for high performance, and how you can become an even more trusted leader. Welcome to the Trusted Leader Show. It's David Horsager. I have a special guest and a friend. He's one of the funniest guys I know, but more than that, he's one of the kindest. Uh, he's great on stage, but he's great off stage. He's a leader of his family and uh, in just a whole lot of other ways. He's written a great book. He's got a great message that is relevant to everyone. We're going to talk about it a little bit. Please welcome my friend, Jason Hewlett. Hey, hey, thanks Jason. for having me, brother. Hey, Jason. Hey, you're coming to us from Salt Lake City area, Utah, uh, at your home studio today, and I'm grateful for that. You were one of the youngest inducted. I think you might have unseated me, but uh, into the Speaker Hall of Fame. You were, uh, you know, you've been on the, the Las Vegas Strip as one of the greatest entertainers, and I think you are the funniest speaker I know but you have a solid, clear, powerful message. You've worked, do a lot of work with millionaires and billionaires. Give us just the quick background on Jason. What's the two minute that we don't know? Well, first of all, what a pleasure to be here. I love this podcast. Was telling you how many episodes I've enjoyed lately with all of our friends. And I'll tell you, started my career in Las Vegas, yes, as an impersonator. I was an impersonator of Ricky Martin and Elton John in the same Legends in Concert show. So I got to impersonate, you know, living la vida loca. And then I'm <laughs> jumping into the Elton John outfit and going, my gift is my song and this one's for you. And so I figured out really quickly, not only do those people have signature moves that make them unique, but that I also had a signature move for doing voices, making people laugh and uh, created a career out of that over 20 years ago. And through the process of discovering how to find the essence of a person, helped me also to realize that every leader has signature moves. And so how do we discover that? And that becomes our promise to share it with the world. And so as a performer, after dinner entertainer, those types of things for corporate events, I have performed in every casino in Las Vegas and equally have transitioned from entertainer after dinner to early morning keynote speaker, fighting the slot with David Horsager, <laughs> and, <laughs> and never winning because you're always the one that takes the gig. But I'll tell you what, I'm a very happy sloppy second for any client that wants me. <laughs> no, you're, it, it's amazing because you know your work aligns with all that we do out of the Trust Edge Leadership Institute. Your, your message now, the promise, uh, oh, I want to get into that. But before we do, I didn't ask for this ahead of time. And you know what? It's not going to do it justice when if people are just listening and not seeing you. We probably can't do some of the moves you do with your face that are unbelievable. But what, what's a couple more impersonations you can give us to start out uh, before we get into even more of the valuable content? Yeah, you know, when I was a kid, finding out I could do voices, that was a big deal. Like... Uh, Pee Wee Herman was a big one when you and I were kids. You know, it was like, <laughs> hey, everybody. And that's obviously not allowed to do anymore in public. But then I realized I could do Alvin and the Chipmunks. Christmas, Christmas time is more. <laughs> you know, and then I'm doing Louis Armstrong. And I think to myself, what a wonderful word. Do -do -do. And I found out I could do funny things with my face for the people that are going to view this online. But I <laughs> I found out that when I practiced those things, it made people laugh. Even if, even if they said it was weird or ugly or bizarre, the laugh is what we leaned into. And so the next thing I knew, I became known as the kid that spread joy, and that's be become my life promise. And you know, speaking of that, you, you you're really good at self-deprecating humor. Like it's just it's not you know bringing everybody else down. It's really bringing everybody else up. So let's get to the promise. You know, you, you, you've you done all this work on the promise. You've written on the promise. You've got the Promise Institute now. What What's the promise? What's, what's the brief? What's that mean? Yeah, I speak about promises and I just ask the audience, you know, what is a promise to you? Promise is essentially whatever you say you're going to do and you do. And all these sales meetings that I go to in leadership where they're talking about goal setting, and I love goals. I've set goals my whole life. But I noticed a while back that if I set a goal and I missed it, I just set another one. 
And so I say, why set a goal when we can make a promise? Because if you set a goal and you miss it, just set another one. But if you make a promise and break it, that's a one and done. So what are the sacred goals that are your promises? The non-negotiables, the intangibles, the 100% accountables. And so I just say that there's three elements to the promise. The first is our audience, because we're all performers. Those are our clients, our customers. And then there's a promise to our family, which is the family at work and the family at home. And the final one is the promise to the one, which is my book. The promise to the one is yourself. And so I just say, well, you know, you could set a promise to your boss or, or, or make a promise to the customer, but what about the promises we make and break to ourselves? And so writing a book about that first really established the promise itself. Absolutely. And you talk about, speaking of pro promises and processes, you talk about this ICM process under the promise. Tell us about that. Maybe start with what's identity? Yeah, so ICM, when I, when I talk about s discovering your signature moves or your personal brand, that which makes you who you are, because as you know, as we just talked about, I am an expert at pulling out the essence of a human in order to impersonate them. And so finding out that everybody has those skills and so forth, I was fascinated, David, the first time I stood in front of a group of leaders, very successful men, and I said, hey, what's your signature move? What makes you stand out in a sit-down world? And they were like deer in headlights. <laughs> and I said, you guys don't know what makes you unique? How are you a great leader and how can you help others discover that too? And so we came up with the process called the ICM process to discover it. ICM stands for identify, clarify, magnify. And so we just sit down and I really force these guys to do a challenging process, which is to just write good things about yourself, write what you identify you're good at. And, you know, if I were to say, hey, write down five things you're good at, they have a problem with that. That's hard. But if I say, write down five things you can improve, they're like, oh, I got 20. Simple. So I, I flip the script and say, let's try to write down 100 things that we are naturally good at, have become our skill set, even aspirationally. And once they've identified as many as they can, we unpack those and it comes up with a cool identify list for the person that's going through the process. Clarify is when you bring in other people. And that's mm. a fun one. And yeah. Because then you're asking people you trust, they clarify for you what they see in you that makes you great. You don't even see the signature moves that they see in you. And so Absolutely. like, I might say to him, you know, in my identify list, I might identify him a funny guy, but you, David might say to me, dude, you're not funny. You're freaking hilarious. And I'm like, oh, I like the clarification word that you gave me better. So I'll lean into that, that I'm hilarious. Okay. I love that. And then I can magnify this whole process by going out and working on each of those traits that I come up with as my top 10 or 20. And it changes my life, the way that I bring my promise proclamation in everything I do. It's a really cool process. At Trust Edge Leadership Institute, we know how difficult it can be to lead a company through change and how debilitating the last couple of years have been to teams. Based on decades of research, we know that to carve the path forward for your people, you need trust. Trust is the key to reignite your company culture. Trust is what will grow your bottom line, and you can't do it alone. What if you could come together with hundreds of leaders from around the world to increase connection, capacity, and also bottom line impact? That's why the Trusted Leader Summit exists. At the summit, you'll surround yourself with C-suite leaders, meet Olympic gold medalists, connect with high performers, and gain tools from global industry experts that you can implement right away to reignite your people. Join us April 12 through 14 at the Mall of America, JW Marriott. If you lead anyone, if trust and integrity matters to you, if you want a high-performing culture, this summit is for you. Get your tickets at trustedleadersummit.com today, and we can't wait to see you there. It's a really cool pro process. I think the interesting thing about that clarify before you magnify is often we don't see, we think everybody's good at the thing that we're naturally good at. We think, oh, that's easy for everybody, I bet. So that's not really unique. And yet that thing can be very unique and others see it in us often before we might see it in ourselves. So so I, well said. Perfect. Yeah. And, and you know, it's a, it's a superpower. 
that we don't even even recognize in ourselves that we have and others see us do it and we're, they're like, dude, you need to do that every time. And you're like, I just naturally do that. I don't know why you think it's so special, but yeah. it truly is. And that's what makes us awesome. Yeah. So this promise proclamation, tell me about some, give us a little more clarity to it. And then I want to ask some examples of people that have really made a promise and kept it. What, what have you seen out there when you've helped people do it? Or what have you seen or ones that you have made? But first, give us a little more clarity of that promise proclamation. Yeah. So when it comes to the magnification portion, that is where the promise comes into it. So if there are words such as my wife gave me the word thoughtful, you're thoughtful. And I was like, I didn't know I was thoughtful. I didn't think enough to know I was thoughtful. (laughs) And I thought I'm going to now proclaim that as part of my promise. And so how can I be thoughtful in every dealing with every client? How can I be thoughtful with my children? How can I be thoughtful even with myself? And so now I'm a little bit more accountable to the things and the actions that I do. It changes the way that we live every single day, how we interact with our customers. And that's why I like to say that a a promise is the highest level of engagement we commit to in any experience, because I don't care about the goals you, you know, you set. I, I care about the promises you make and keep. And so keep a promise with me when it comes to magnifying that i just say what are the proclamations you want to have in your life and eventually we can come up with a a proclamation that leads everything so for me it's been i promise to spread joy in every interaction and so if i'm at a restaurant and the waitress walks up and hands me some food i'm going to say something that will bring her joy whether it's complimenting her Uh, efforts or do something silly with my face, (laughs) Mm -hmm. you know, or maybe be like, what's in this drink? It just ruined my voice, you know, and then they laugh, but I am spreading joy wherever I go. And that becomes a promise. I could easily hide that all day. It's, Mm -hmm. it's easier to just lay back, keep it in a drawer. But when we can share and magnify that promise, it makes a big difference in seeing that, you know, you ask the question, how has this helped other people as they've magnified their promises? Well, it's been amazing to watch people who have struggled with weight loss, for example, when they have all these resolutions and goals, you know, here we are recording this and the end of January, but think about it. My goodness, the gym was busy the first week. I went this morning in the middle of January and I'm like, where is everybody? You <laughs> slackers. Come on, man. But then I thought, you know what? It's because we had a, goal set that didn't get hit and when we set a goal it's a deadline but we make a promise it becomes a behavior becomes Hmm. something we are and so you know we can make a promise and and do something unique and so watching people that say i'm going to make a promise to get healthy this year what what does healthy look like well that's when you set the goals goals are particulars promises are proclamations so what are the what are the goals the little goals that need to be accomplished each day in order to come up with your promise proclamation to be healthy Hmm. I, uh, I, you know, people have heard this before and, you know, a big challenge for me is just staying fit. And so it's a good example. So, t- you know, 2011, uh, I, I said, uh, I'm going to get to my high school weight or I'll give you it to, this was to my staff, 2,500 bucks each. And that was a big deal, even bigger deal than when I didn't have, you know, it's a, uh, I knew it was a big deal. My wife is like, what are you talking about? And she knows, um, like responsibility is a big deal for me. If I say something, I'll do it. Now I've, I've done this with other people and they haven't kept the promise, but I know if, if no matter what, if I'm not at that weight, I'll give out the $2,500 or I'll have lost the weight. I'll keep the promise one way or the other. And that was a big motivator for me. And that, that I mean, I was like, you know, that's 50 pounds or whatever. It, it, it was like, I, at the very end, it was like three pounds under. And I'm like, oh, you know, but I, I was aware I would have not eaten the last week if I had to, I think. But, but, um, <laughs> but it was, a, it was, it, it mattered for me. It kept, kept me focused. The, the, the commitment, the promise, there is something about saying that rather than, hey, I just kind of have this goal. Hey, I'm committed. I'm promising. And for me, I'm promising I'll give you something I don't want to give um, if I'm not, at this at this weight one of the things we we talk about with trust too is how do you how do you rebuild trust how do you rebuild trust once you've lost it and one thing we found is you never rebuild it on the apology you you never rebuild trust by by apologizing that doesn't mean don't apologize that certainly doesn't mean don't be humble but the only way to rebuild trust is to make and keep a new commitment or promise the only way i'll ever rebuild it and so um i think the biggest problem on the 
on the health example that I gave is the biggest problem with not um, making that wait by May 1st or some of these kind of things is I lose trust in myself whenever I make a goal and don't keep it, and even more when I make a promise and don't keep it. And so um, that's that's a you know we're trying to increase trust. We see the value of trust everywhere, and if we don't make and keep promises. We don't trust ourselves, and it's kind of like, not to jump here, but you hear the idea, love your neighbors yourself. You find someone who doesn't love themselves at all, you you find someone who's not very fun to be around. It's the same with people that don't trust themselves. They breed poison all over, and why don't people trust themselves? Because they don't make and keep promises. That's beautiful. Well said. Like somebody who's researched and spoken about trust for a long time, David. Well done. <laughs> no. Well, I mean, it's just your your work aligns so much with what we talk about, and and uh, I just love it, and I love what it means to us on the stage. I love what it means to us as leaders or in boardrooms, and I love what it means to us, especially in family and faith, and in many ways. So, um, you know, what what are you what are you working on these days? What are you learning these days? Oh man. So much is going on. It's been really fascinating to go through COVID and the pandemic. I made a career for over 20 years on stages in front of thousands of people at a time, and I never had a backup plan. I never had online courses or coaching or any of these other things that would have been really smart to have created (laughs) before a pandemic hit. But I'll tell you, as I scrambled and became a virtual speaker once my calendar was wiped out in March of 2020. That showed me that I have other signature moves I didn't know that I had, such as resilience, creativity, and technology. Uh, Just the ability to have energy that is almost unsustainable for a normal person. To be able to work endless hours and still be connected to my family, to still keep my promise to be present with them. And I do like that hashtag be present concept, especially with family. But Uh, Yeah, of late, meaning of the last two years, losing all the work, recreating it for virtual, and then saying, I will accept some coaching clients. And meaning I have a lot of people that come to me and say, hey, help me come up with my promise legacy project. And, uh, you know, if they're a little bit older and successful, then they'll hire me to help them come up with that, which they, you know, they've already accomplished a lot. But I like to say, okay, let's say the plane is going down. What's the one thing that you wish you had accomplished before you were gone? Let's work on that. And so that's what I've been helping some people do, whether it's creating a better speech, working on their messaging, writing a book, whatever it might be. It's that thing that we want to leave with somebody and it becomes a great promise to live towards. Hmm. So working on that and writing consistently. I I write a blog weekly. That's one of my promises. It's one of those things where you're like, I'm going to write it on Monday because it comes out Sunday. And then on Saturday night at midnight, I'm like, yeah, I got to keep the promise. <laughs> <laughs> where, hey, where can people where can people find the blog? Blog is just at my website, which is jasonhewlett.com and the blog page. But they could also access it if they wanted just through their phones by typing 22828 and then typing in the letters J-H-E for Jason Hewlett Entertainment. So that's a, that's a cool way to do, you know, reminders of promises and fun stories, videos that I share. So yeah, 22828, that's the number. So that'll all be in the show notes, trustedleadershow.com. You'll find Jason Hewlett, exactly how to spell his name, his website. And of course, you'll also find how to get to the blog and the little 22 number that you can text. (laughs) (laughs) Say that one more time, 22. 22828, yeah. All right, that's awesome. J-H-E. So what... (laughs) What, give us one story, like one of these that you've told in your blog of, of somebody who's kept a promise. Um, you know, what would that look like? How did that change the lives? What What's an example? Oh, man, there are so many that have been, been cool of late. I'll say that uh, there are people that do uh, incredible things each and every day. In fact, I saw something that was really neat recently, and it, it was a video that I found out was a couple of years old. But there was a – there were – you know, ice skaters, they all won their first, second, and third place. The Japanese guy gets first place. The Canadian gets third place. They're standing next to each other on the podium. Music for the Japanese national anthem starts playing, and all of a sudden the Canadian who took third place realizes there's no Japanese flag in front of this champion for him to salute or bow. So what does the Canadian do? 
just out of the kindness of his impromptu thinking. He literally grabs the flag that's behind both of them, the Japanese flag, by the corner and holds it up as the shocked champion uh, turns around and bows to his flag that's now being held up by a Canadian. Mm. Mm. I love that story. You know, here are two competitors and to have the respect for somebody else to do that in without even thinking twice. Hmm. He just did what should be done in competition, mm-hmm. in sport. Just like you and I, we, we could be called competitors. We get gigs that I should get and you should get and we might get it one year or the other. David, I'm going to refer you all day because I know you're a champion. I know you're the best they could have. And I love that. I love that thought. Mm-hmm. And so that was just one story of recent that I shared that I was like, I love that that Canadian did that. And they said in the newspaper, they're like, this might be the most beloved person in all of Japan, this Canadian bronze medalist, yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's awesome. I love that. And we loved it. And we need to see more stories of good. Actually, we don't have to be divisive. We can care for each other and uh, encourage one another and even be selfless. Um, so what a great example. Hey, J- Jason, I know you have habits when I, when I generally see leaders that I respect and look up to in many ways. And I know um, there's many things you're leading, not to mention, I know some of the pe- people you're coaching now have exited companies and are worth billions or millions. And they're asking you to kind of help build their, their uh, legacy promise. But people like you that are touching others well, that are kind of the same on stage and off, even though you're really funny, um, you're this humble, you know, as I know you as a just a a down to earth guy. It seems like they have some habits, Uh, maybe maybe it's health habits. You said you're in the gym, but they have habits they do about every day to keep in touch with their family, to whatever it is. What are what are a few habits that you have or repeaters, we call them, that you do to you know, keep you ready to be leading and influencing others. I appreciate that question. Uh, and I appreciate that you shared your health journey as well, because I never knew you at the way you were talking about. I've only known you as Mr. Fitness man. And so <laughs> I love that you've got this question going on because I too have had the struggle with the weight, but I found out that if I had You know, if I wake up every single day and I'm waiting to go to the gym, I feel this burden all day. And I work out way better in the afternoon or evening just because of my, when I was a kid, that was easiest. So what I did is I changed my sleep in the last year. I changed this habit of if I'm going to wake up and work out, I'm just going to get up and go for it. And so uh, five o'clock, I go to the gym every day. It's awesome. I love it. I take a cold shower after and not just because Wim Hof tells us we should jump in an ice bath every morning, but because I've noticed that this actually works. It energizes me. It gets me rolling for the day. And if I can live these things that I've been challenged to do in some ways and others have found that it actually works for me, I'm now intermittent fasting, which I prefer over eating all, you know, seven or eight meals a day and the small meals like I was coached. Now I've lost the weight and I'm keeping it off. Uh, I like to journal a lot. I'm a everyday journaler pretty much. I also listen to podcasts when I work out and those kind of things that really inspire me. And so when there's congruence on and off our stage, whether we're a performer, a speaker, or the stage of being in sales and leadership, if we're incongruent, it will be noticed because our integrity is our harmony. And so we must be the same on and off stage. That doesn't mean I have to be hilarious all the time. I can turn it up to an 11 when it needs to be, but I, it's always there. There's always a tinge of it there. And then another habit that I'd say has been really helpful has been a personal touch point with each child every day. I have four children, three of them are in their teens, and then we have one that's 10. And how do I influence them on a daily basis, whether it's I'm home and I'm walking by and asking how they're doing and we have a quick connection or I'm on the road and I'm sending a quick video or a text that I know will connect with them. Uh, Having that one personal one-on-one touch every single day with my children and especially my wife. 
that makes all the difference in my habits. Mm-hmm. We both have four children. We both uh, challenged each other in some of those ways. And I think some things go through a flow. Like I remember I was very intentional for a few years. I give a video every day when I was on the road, flying 200 times a year, whatever. Every single morning, I'd give a little uh, encouragement and and uh, sometimes a Bible verse or whatever and to my to my family. And then I'm like, oh, that's kind of run its course. What's the new thing? And then I would get, do this and I would do, you know, there's sometimes there was things I didn't, um, there's some things I think are absolute stick with and there's some things um, did for years and then, okay, they're teenagers, they're in college or they're whatever and look, let's try something, uh, something else. So... Anyway, that's I love it. Boy, 5 a.m. and a cold shower, cold ice <laughs> ice bath. I, guess I might have to try the new one. Hey, on intermittent, what's your what are your hours? Like, do you wait till after? When do you first eat, or what's the hours that you eat? Well, how's your intermittent work? Mostly, it's two to six, and I prefer that. And uh, and I might only eat one meal, or I might eat two good meals. Um, and I don't necessarily do that every single day because I think that's unsustainable in a lot of ways. It, there are some days when we might have a fun thing with family, so I'll, I'll just go off it completely for the day, but I'll continue to eat my healthy way, which is very, very low carb and no sugars at all. And so, yeah, that's worked for me, man. It's been amazing. Love it. No sugars. I'm telling you, ice cream, uh, that's just <laughs> tough. <laughs> I think the last time I was up there with you, we were having some like Minnesota custard or something. Ice and I was cream, like, exactly. where am I? Ice cream, where are we? <laughs> it's funny and, thing, you know, I, I might have said this before, so I don't want to be redundant, but I believe at least at one point, and I believe still today, Minnesota is the highest per capita ice cream eater in the country uh, per person. And, and people wonder why would they still eat ice cream in the winter and everything else? I think partly it's because Dairy Queen's headquarters uh, are up here and every little town is a Dairy Queen, but uh, there might be some other reasons too. <laughs> so uh, there's so much more we could say. What I, I, One question before I get to one of the final questions. What, you know, you are so amazing on stage. If people haven't seen you, you you're, the power of your message is powerful, but you are an amazing entertainer. I mean, people that we know, I mean, like really like the, the best. Uh, how How do you prepare or how have you over the years prepared, uh, you know, for doing that, especially when you had to do it every day? You got to come in fresh every day. Yeah, I remember asking a Las Vegas headliner who was very, very famous. And I said, how have you done this for 40, 50 years in a row? Same thing over and over, because essentially the act didn't change very much for them. And they said, you know, each time somebody shows up, it's the first time and it could be the last and that's what keeps me rolling. Hmm. And they would also make a promise to themselves to have fun with it each and every time as if it were the first time performing it, even though it was perfectly rehearsed. And so a lot of my confidence on stage uh, comes from my practice and the amount of time I have put in to it just being automatically good. And I mean, I can still go back to the routines that I've created years and years ago that are now retired because of vocal issues or physicality that I can't do it anymore. And I can still throw those down. It's crazy, but it's mm. because it's muscle memory. It's mm-hmm. the same as a great basketball player that stands at the line and shoots a free throw when the game's on the line. You, you really want your mind to go blank and then you just perform. Mm-hmm. But that's the power of showing up every day, doing the work. And I'll tell you, David, Tougher to do a show in front of 25 people than it was 25,000. That's mm-hmm. for dang sure. Mm-hmm. <laughs> because you get the energy from the audience. You're pumped up. You're pumping yourself up in front of a group of 25 people or even even 250 people is rough after you just got off the stage in a stadium or an arena. Mm-hmm. But especially that's virtually. been part of the promise. <laughs> yeah, especially. <laughs> oh. yeah, yeah, but I love it, man. I, I love getting on stage. And I, I love teaching people how to be better on stage. It's really, it's really a beautiful process. And I do think you have to have a screw loose in some ways, and that's important. <laughs> the right kind of screw loose to be able to say, I'm confident enough to get up here and do something incredible or weird or amazing, but I'm also humble enough to work my tail off to make it awesome for you. Well, 
this has been fantastic. Lots more we could talk about, but I have huge respect for you. For everybody listening, look at the show notes, trustedleadershow.com, jasonhewlett.com. You can find everything about Jason, about the promise, the promise to his family, the promise to the one, and uh, just plain the promise. So grateful to have you on, grateful to call you friend. Our last question, it's a trusted leader show. Who's a leader you trust and why? Well, this person will not listen to this podcast because she's too busy dealing with our children. But let me talk about my wife, my favorite leader, the best one I think I've ever seen. Somebody who can help the neighbor and at the same time influence the lives of our children. Hmm. Somebody who has a strong and deep faith and somebody who can still hang along with me while I put us through heck over 2020 and 2021, trying to figure out pandemic life, and yet she still says, I believe in you. Hmm. A great leader like her is very rare to find. I believe they can be made. I don't think leaders just have to be born. I think we can become a great leader. Listening to podcasts like this, reading books like you've created and so forth, but to have a wife named Tammy who is my trusted leader, Hmm. whatever she says, I believe. Mm -hmm. If she tells me I'm not present because I'm on my phone too much, I delete those apps and I get present. I'm grateful for her as my trusted leader. Hmm. Tammy is amazing. Moms as a whole, by the way, in the research, uh, the person that people trust the most in the world is not the Pope, Oprah, or Denzel. It is, in fact, mom. Uh, So I know your kids trust her too, but but your wife is an amazing, an amazing mom, leader, and friend. So we can't go far from that. This has been the Trusted Leader Show special guest, Jason Hewlett. He's amazing on stage and off. Thank you so much for being on, Jason. Until next time, stay trusted. 